Hey guys, what's up? This is Jess. Welcome back to Roots and Refuge Farm. I am standing outside my garden for our weekly-ish garden tour. Today is June the 29th. So we are full swing in the gardening season. And while I have been harvesting quite a bit out of the garden over the last month or so, this is the first garden tour where we are taking baskets and we are harvesting as we go because there's a lot to pick out here. Uh, we are growing here in central Arkansas, zone 7B if you're new, and uh, natural growing practices, largely organic in this uh, large raised bed garden. We've got about 2,200 square feet of planting space in the garden. The fence garden area is about 10,000 square feet. So. Let's go in and take a look because we have a lot of lot to pick and actually not a whole lot of light left for the evening. I've actually enlisted the help of a couple of my babies to come and help me get some of this picking done because we have a lot to pick, right? They are actually going to get started picking the beans and I'm going to take you guys around and we're going to pick some other things as well. Now, we have been really consumed around here lately with getting our alpacas home and settled, uh, which has been a wonderfully worthy endeavor. However, there are some projects in the garden, like my little chalkboard entry sign here, and some different things that have been on the to-do list that just have not made it high enough on the priority list to get done. However, um, I'm really hoping to get these things done this week. Everything else is really starting to settle down, and so, um, kind of turning turning back to these gardening projects. Over here on the side of the greenhouse, you can see that the elephant ears are looking very, very lovely. And a lot of the things here on the side are starting to fill out. Um, unfortunately, some of the things that I planted here sort of fizzled out. So I may stick something else in there. And actually over here uh, are our bees and they have been a welcome addition to the farm. I really do feel like the garden is responding well to having the extra pollinators and bees are just really, really cool. Look at those little bean pickers. Now, in on my first garden bed here, this is um, lettuce and radishes that have gone to seed and I'm letting them go so I can save the seeds. And here we have the Tanya's Pink Potted Beans of which I've picked a ton, but at this point, the ones that are left, I'm actually allowing these to dry because I would like to save seeds for these beans. <laughs> and what I've set the kids on picking on this trellis, these are the purple potted beans. And actually, any of the varieties that I mention in this video, I will make a list down below, so on the show notes, if you just click show more, um, that way, if you need the spelling or anything like that, you can find it down there. So you don't have to search through the video for something I mentioned, as well as try to decipher my incredibly southern accent and how often I mispronounce things. So the purple potted beans are seeds I got from Baker Creek. Crazy, crazy prolific. These were prolific in the fall, and I just cannot believe how many beans that this, I think probably half a pack of seeds planted these plants and how many they have produced is absolutely crazy. Like quite literally they have they have produced gallons of purple snap beans. It's been kind of dry and hot. It's the end of the day. A lot of times I do my tours in the morning because things look a little bit better but uh, so if you see things looking just a little bit puny uh, I just need the water is all that is. And here I've got eggplants and we're actually starting to have quite a few eggplants starting on the different plants. You'll notice a lot of my plants are just completely bug riddled. It's just been a really hard year for pests and I honestly haven't fought them too terribly hard. So you see bug damage, there's actually flea beetles actively on this, but the plants are producing so it'll be okay. Hey silly boy, wow you got a basket full of beans, very nice. Now we're starting to get quite a few jalapenos. Um, so far, not really enough to do anything with as far as canning goes. I've just been picking them as I cook with them and I will continue to do that. This right here is a lemon drop hot pepper. So these will actually ripen to yellow. And like many hot peppers, they grow upwards towards the sun, which is really neat. <laughs> And this is a Bridge to Paris pepper, and these actually will ripen to red, but I kind of wanted to just try it green. 
I like peppers that really taste like peppers that aren't super sweet, but that also aren't super hot. And this is one of those. Bridge to Paris. This is my first time to grow it. I think it might get hotter the further it goes. Well, come here. <laughs> Benjamin said, is that spicy? And I said, no. And he said, can I have one? Here. Oh, it actually spicy. No, it wasn't spicy. Tastes like a jalapeno. It's not that spicy. Mm. You don't like it? Mm. Thinking. You're thinking. Does it taste that spicy? Mm-mm. It's not spicy. It's not spicy. <laughs> Sometimes peppers are spicy. That's true. This has a tiny bit of spicy in it. Yeah. Do you like it? So here's the top. Peppo Gallo pepper. It's kind of an interesting shaped one. It's got a few more fruit setting. Are you back for pepper secondsies? Yeah. We're splitting it. I actually am noticing a lot of jalapenos here, and I think I am going to go ahead and harvest these jalapenos. Some of these are on the small side, but I'm gonna go ahead and pick them because I have a lot of tomatoes to make salsa with, and I can use these. Oh, there we go. Here, Benjamin, this one's not spicy. It's not really ripe, so it's probably not gonna be super sweet. You wanna try it anyway? Is it the same one? Use the pears. Drew, grab the pepper, I'll cut it. Okay, you got it? Yeah. Okay. You wanna try it? That's the manganji sweet pepper. But it's probably not super sweet because it's not very ripe. Good. Good? Can I try it? Benjamin on the garden tours means less produce makes it in the house. It's kind of sweet. I bet it'd be really sweet if you let it get ripe. Yeah. <laughs> Down here on the end, I've got okra growing. Most of this is old Alabama red, but a couple of them are crimson spineless. Oh, maybe that one, that's solid green. I don't know, these aren't really putting out a whole lot of pods yet. Oh look, my first chrysanthemum melon. It's a baby. Don't pick it, it's a baby. Can't see any more on there. Oh wait, there's a tiny baby one. That's exciting. Oh man, there's a lot of ripe tomatoes over there. Wow, Malia has a basket full of beans and there are still so many to pick. This is why I asked the kids for their help because I wouldn't have gotten a video shot if I was picking all those beans. So these peppers are kind of struggling. My kids' garden looks amazing. Their peppers and their eggplants look amazing. All the peppers and the eggplants in my garden have struggled this entire time. And I'm noticing that the peppers that are doing better are the ones that I put in later and the kids garden was the same. And I think, because I was looking at some old footage from the garden a couple years ago and my peppers and eggplants were monstrously huge. So fruitful. I was swimming in peppers and eggplants that year. That year, we were really late putting the garden in. I didn't plant my peppers and eggplants until like mid to late May and they just exploded. And we didn't plant the kids garden until mid to late May because we were just late getting it in. And I really think that I've jumped the gun and I've put my peppers and eggplants in too soon after the last frost and the nights were too cool or the soil was too cool and it somehow stunted it. So next year, <laughs> Please remind me of this whenever I am super anxious to get the garden in. <laughs> Next year I'm going to wait a little longer. These were some of the ones that I put in a little bit later filling in some spots. This is some of the Hascaria hot chilies, which I'm planning on uh, drying those and making a chili powder with them. And these red mini bells are a little bit scrawny as plants, but they're pretty loaded down. Um, and also over here I've got some serranos that I put in. Uh, and they're they're kind of puny. Look at that black beauty Is that tomato. Isn't that beautiful? Is Check out the Kajari melons. They're finally making it to the top of the trellis. I'll be it a little bit 
lopsided here. So I come through here regularly with these melons that I'm trying to trellis and when they just send off these little shoots, you just kind of put them back towards the trellis to get it to grow up. But you can see here I've got baby Kajari melons. And this other side is really kind of starting to take off. It was a little slower start. The flowers here in the front are looking beautiful. This Redmond Super Cactus Zinnia, now that's one seed in the ground, one plant that's filled out like this. And it is just gorgeous. So these are all about to get pulled out. All of these brassicas, which have completely been devoured by worms. The tomatoes on the other side are looking pretty good. I lost a lot of tomatoes this week, not the plants, but the fruit uh, to our chickens getting in our garden. I've deduced that that, that is what was eating my fruit. For days, I kept coming down here and finding half eaten fruit that was hanging low, that was ripe, it was so frustrating. But we actually, fix the fences and clip the chickens wings to contain them in the fence where they're supposed to be and they have not been out wandering around and I haven't had a single damaged fruit since then so I'm pretty sure it must have been them. Even still, um, I usually let fruit ripen on the vine but I've been picking it a little bit early since the chickens and since we were having damaged fruit and also we've just been having a lot of caterpillars. So I'm going to go ahead and pick uh, several of these tomatoes even though they're they're just slightly underripe. One thing I have to be sure of picking them a little underripe is that I'm cutting them off because if you go pulling on them and they're not really ready to come off of the vine they're going to tear the plant which is not good. So These are Paul Robeson's and just leaving these on the counter for like a day or so they should be ready to go. Knowing when to pick tomatoes seems to be a big question that I'm getting asked right now. You know, I grow a lot of varieties that are not necessarily red or yellow or just an obvious color. For instance, like this large barred boar here. Uh, this is a streaked to red and green tomato. Now, I don't know if you can see here, but this one is actually completely ready. Like this tomato is soft. Um, I'm trying to show you without just completely damaging it. Um, you can see that there's a lot of give to it, and this one actually started to split, um, probably because we just got a little bit of rain. And with a lot of tomatoes that are not like a solid traditional color, one thing that you've just got to do to tell whether they're ready to pick is to squeeze them a little bit. If they've got some give to them and they're not hard, uh, you can go ahead and pick them then. I like to err on the side of caution and pick them a little bit underripe. I do think you get the best flavor if you can let your tomatoes ripen on the vine. However, this has been a very yard, hard year for pests. Um, and so for me, I would rather let it ripen on the counter and eat it rather than pick it perfectly ripe while it has worms all in it or like we have the chickens getting to them. Here's another question that I'm being asked where people say, what is it when you've got these cracks uh, around the top of an otherwise good-looking tomato. Um, this cracking is not pretty, but it's really mostly just a cosmetic issue. Now sometimes whenever you end up with a deep crack like this one, uh, the tomato won't scab over well and you'll end up with little pockets of rot, but basically cracking like this is coming from inconsistent watering. Now in my case, it's been very, very, very hot here. We've had days that are upwards of, you know, the high 90s, very hot, and spans that are very, very dry where I can water my tomatoes, but even watering them every few days when it's really hot like that, the fruits themselves do tend to dry out, which is not necessarily bad for flavor. Like if you can pick your tomatoes on a really hot and dry day, they're going to be like ultra concentrated in flavor because all those sugars are, are super concentrated. But the issue that we're having and why a lot of my fruit looks like this is because every so often we're getting these massive thunderstorms where we get like three inches of rain in a night, which results in this because the fruit just can't take that much expansion so the skin cracks. For instance, my yellow cherry tomatoes are all the, well, always the first to crack. Whereas the red ones seem to hold up a little bit better. Um, but that thin skin, which is so nice to eat in a yellow cherry tomato, it's just that super thin, sweet skin, uh, it doesn't hold up to the water quite as well. So you see that, just check. Uh, what I typically do is I'll cut this top off and make sure there's no rot inside of it. But this is still totally a usable tomato. 
Now this plant was a new one for me this year and as you can see it's starting to get some spot. I've been doing the peroxide spray on these, uh, combating any sort of fungal yuckiness but you have to reapply it after the rain and I'm seeing a lot of this spot come back after the rain. But these Italian heirlooms is what they're called and some of these tomatoes have just been monsters. This one's blushing. I'm really nervous to leave it out here and risk worms getting in it. This has been about typical of the Italian heirloom. A really good sized heart shaped tomatoes, probably 12 to 14 ounces each. Every one of them that I've harvested so far. I mean, that's a big tomato. And they're super meaty. Uh, the, the batch of salsa that I am getting ready to make that I picked the peppers for, this uh, is going to be, I think it's going to be a majority of these because I've picked several of these and they have very few seeds. I really like this one. I'm going to wait and pick this one tomorrow. Let it get a little more ripe on the vine. I'm really nervous. I hope nothing gets to it. I hope it's safe. <laughs> this is a Missouri pink love apple. It is slightly underripe, but it'll probably be just about perfect tomorrow. That one's a little funky shaped, but I really like the way this tomato looks. My slicer basket has not been quite as lovely this year as in years past. <laughs> with, this, with all the blemishes and stuff on them. <laughs> Look at that bad boy. Just starting to blush. I think this is my largest Dr. Witchies this year. And... It's on the vine with another big monster one. That This has got to weigh over a pound. That's a huge tomato. Now this is really cool, and I don't think that I'm going to be able to really convey how cool it is to you. But this is Wild Boar Farms, one of the new varieties that were offered this year. It's called Cherokee Rose, and it's actually uh, developed from a mutation on a Cherokee purple. Uh, so the skin is like a matte. So this is like a Cherokee purple with almost like a slightly fuzzy skin and I, I don't think you're going to be able to really see that through the camera so just imagine touching a tomato with really soft skin right now this is pretty cool obviously this is a this was a fused one so it's like a funky one um, but here are some more normal shaped and like I, you can see there's just no shine to the skin Unlike here next to it, see this is a Kellogg's breakfast. You see that shine that it has? And then again the Cherokee Rose, which is matte. Isn't that interesting? And this little guy here, this is called Daniels. And this one fruit is hanging so low, it makes me nervous that something's gonna get to it. But is that not just the most beautiful tomato? It's so perfect. I really hope that it ripens and actually is that perfect. A couple more. Paul Robeson's there, and here's a German Johnson, which this is a pink tomato, so like this looks really light, but it actually doesn't get dark red, so it'll pink it up a little bit more tomorrow, but that one will be like ready. All the ones that I'm picking a little underripe here, one day on the counter and they'll be good to go. And like if you're ever picking and you accidentally pull one off that's not ripe, you can either fry it green. Uh, like a true southerner and eat fried green tomatoes or just set it on your windowsill and it'll ripen up on the windowsill. Flavor might not be quite as perfect as if it had gotten to ripen outside but a lot of people actually prefer to pick their tomatoes at the very first sign of blush just so that they don't risk anything getting to them first. And even though that's not my favorite, it still beats the heck out of store-bought tomatoes. Got some more Clemson spineless okra over here, which I just harvested one little pod off of. So these should be cranking them out here before too long. My garden helpers came and cleaned out the garden candy, the ground cherries of any ripe ones, and uh, they actually went back in the house. <laughs> they did pick a bunch of beans first. There's another little tomato. The ground cherries have done wonderfully. Um, this is the one that volunteered, it's massive. And then the ones that we planted from starts that were sent to us in the mail by one of our sweet viewers, they're doing really well as well. All of the ground cherries you've seen us eating so far are all pineapple variety. We also have some Aunt Molly's ground cherries that I started. Um, the pineapple ones were sent to us, that was our favorite last year, and the ones I started didn't really do well. 
but we did have one big massive one volunteer and actually we've had a few others pop up in the garden that volunteered as well from last year all in places that there were no ground cherries last year so those must have been seeds that were carried over by birds here kind of hiding underneath the ground cherry is my variegated basil and man this basil is so spicy it's really really good and I think it's gonna be awesome for like marineras and I'm eager to dry some of it because I think it's just gonna do really well in that kind of sauce that can carry a punch but this is some spicy basil a beautiful plant though even just shaking it like this like it's tickling my nose it's so spicy we got some puny peppers here you always got to check things from the other side because you'll miss stuff here's a couple of tomatoes i didn't see that is actually a little black brandy wine right there the holy basil is getting Huge. It smells beautiful. I wish I had smell-o-vision for this. I wish I could just put this down in here and all you guys take a whiff of that. My cousin Josh texted me today. He's growing a garden. He lives in Little Rock about 45 minutes from here and he messaged me and said his holy basil was not super fragrant. Now I'm literally like ready to drive to his house to go smell it and see what he's talking about. But have you guys had any experience with growing a holy basil that wasn't super fragrant because I've actually got a couple of different plants of holy basil. One's from a seed packet that I believe came from MI Gardener and then some of these are starts that I got at a local store. I was just so surprised they had holy basil that I bought the starts um, that I didn't need which probably denotes a problem but anyway that's not the point. The point is does your holy basil smell amazing? Because if his doesn't like I want to know why. Where'd you get your seeds from? Does it smell awesome? We need to get to the bottom of this. Okay, so these giant kales are blocking my lettuce leaf basil from doing really well. And I'm not okay with that, so I just pulled those out. This is a neat basil. These leaves are supposed to get huge um, and be more like a sweet flavor, so I'm, I'm really hoping this thing is gonna get big and do well. I've obviously got more tomatoes over there to harvest. This was also what let me know that it was a chicken in here. That is totally chicken looking damage. It's a lot of land chamomile. This is one of the areas where it's coming up. This smells so good. So here are my competition tomato plants and I'm actually going to put something on these to protect them, like a net or something. I've got to figure out what I can put on them um, because I don't want to risk anything happening. Now my, my beef steak is just loaded. Thankfully still setting flowers, most of which are not falling off. Um, I'm having a little bit of blossom drop from the heat, but overall this plant is just loaded. And I do have a little bit of bug damage. Um, I did lose one fruit on this one from bug damage, and so I definitely want to be proactive here because I want to win. So that's my, my beef steak. And over here is my climbing triple crop. This is the fruit that I'm really hoping might put me in a good place for the largest fruit. Um, obviously, I'm just watching it really closely because that is a really big tomato. Plant overall looks like it could have a good total weight, but um, that's a good one. I don't actually see any like really unusually large fruits forming on the beefsteak. They all look pretty like normal average maybe like you know like nine or ten ounce globes there's nothing that's just extraordinary I, I planted the climbing triple crop going for my biggest tomato though because last year I got such huge tomatoes off of that and it and when I saw that it had set a fused blossom I was like yes because that's where those monster tomatoes come from <laughs> this is on another climbing triple crop plant this one's really cool because it's like totally heart shaped but that's another really large one and here I've got a beef steak uh, down here that's putting off some huge fruits, but this is not the one that I'm growing for the competition, so. This is a prime example as to why I pick Faciati blossoms whenever I see them. With 120 tomato plants, I don't see all of them, obviously I've showed you several uh, funky tomatoes, but this right here, is one fruit that grew from a fused blossom and I actually tore it in half trying to get it off the plant because the way that it was growing up here, um, 
there was no good way to cut it off. So this piece actually came off, but if you look down in there, there's a bunch of like yucky rot going on down in here. Like this, there's very little of this that's actually usable. You see it's got this big pocket. And this is what you end up with when you get a bunch of those fused blossoms um, and you let them go. You might get big tomatoes. Sometimes it's okay. Like for instance, that one on the climbing triple crop, that was two, that was just like two blossoms fused together. But if you ever see one of those gnarly ones, it's like four, five, six, like that was probably multiple ones fused together and it just didn't develop right. It's kind of a bummer. This is cool. The Thai soldier beans are starting to flower and put off beans. I'm really pumped to see these. Now these are sold as a bush bean and as you can see they're climbing really high. I don't think that I would really classify this as a bush. Um, however it's okay. Uh, the space that I put them in still does work for them but it has created this really wonderfully wild space going on here which is actually my favorite place in the whole garden. Um, got the ground cherries, massive sunflowers growing up. Here in these buckets I've got my curly mint as well as my variegated mint. The green stalk is looking really lovely. Check out that marigold. Isn't that beautiful? And then here we've got the battle between the Thai soldier beans as well as my blue butterfly peas. They're just all growing all through here this explosion of queen lime zinnias. These are almost as tall as me. All different colors, they remind me of sherbet. Then over here, more butterfly peas coming up, blossoming, chamomile all throughout here. The noodle beans, which we have picked so many of and they're just so stinking prolific. Here we have my uh, scarlet runner beans, which came up on their own. I'm actually letting those dry. I'm gonna pick those as dry beans. Can you even with this space right here? This space right here and the way this feels is why I grow this garden. It's glorious. It absolutely is just wonderful. I just tried to sneak a tomato without filming it. Yeah. <laughs> I knew this was gonna be messy. This is why I don't like salad that size tomatoes. Cause it made me look like a slob. The Painted Lady Tomato which I was so pumped to grow because of its variegated leaves, actually lost most of its variegation in the full sun of being outside. It looked way more variegated when it was started in the house and in the greenhouse. It has a few little spots here and there that show some color, but not a lot. However, I really do like the tomatoes. They're saladette size, which I don't care for because they're just, you can't just pop them in your mouth and they're just not really worth slicing. So you end up with it all over your shirt. This is what I have against salad at tomatoes. But I also don't like that they're usually really like jelly. Uh, and the Painted Lady is not. It's a pretty meaty little and I really do like it. It's pretty too and it's not a cracked mess. This one's kind of a cracked mess, but it's a streaky tomato. Someone cruising. I've actually also got lots of ripe cherries, less uh, less now than I did an hour ago before Benjamin and Malia came down. Uh, this is the blue cream berries from Wild Boar Farms. Last year I grew the blueberries and the blue gold berries and this year I went ahead and threw the blue cream into the mix and I was kind of expecting it to be very very similar to the yellow but it is different enough to warrant growing it. It's got a very, very thin skin, which means it does crack whenever you get a lot of rain. But if you stay on top of picking them, it's very, very sweet. The skin is so thin. My dad actually came over the other day for the first time since the tomatoes have been ripening and we stood down here and tried all the different kinds. And this is one that really, really impressed him. They're also ridiculously prolific. The blueberries line um, is just crazy how many they put on. They produce more than anything else uh, tomato-wise in the garden. Just look at all of this unripe fruit that's all over these. I'm actually not picking cherry tomatoes today because my kids usually do that. So this happened this week. Isn't that lovely? Our first Titan sunflower opened. We've started picking cucumbers. Um, it doesn't look like they have any ripe right now. Scratch that. We definitely do. There we go. And over here on this side, I've got a couple of white wonders. 
these white wonders I got the seeds from in my gardener when they are picked younger like this the seeds taste sweet like eating this cucumber it's got just the sweetest flavor to it I'm really enjoying this one it's been pretty prolific too I think I've probably picked about eight off of this since it started producing just like a week and a half ago and the vines aren't even halfway up the trellis yet it's covered in blossoms lots of immature fruit so I think that the white wonder is going to make it on my like must grow list. Here the Cajo watermelons are sizing up. We've got several on there. And over here the Benny Kadima watermelons are coming along. We've got some blank spaces here in the garden that I need to refill since some of my squash came out and down there where we pulled the garlic out. And I'd love to know what you guys would like to see growing. What you would like to see more of. If you want me to try to experiment with something, I've got a long season, so I mean, there are still quite a few things that I could put in here. Let me know what you'd like to see growing in the garden because I'm gonna be replanting a couple of these places this week. Teddy bear sunflowers, and you know, I was so concerned after I had been told about companion planting beans next to flowers. I can't believe I have to finish the store with tomato cheese all over my shirt. So I had been warned after planting this that sunflowers don't do well with beans. The Thai soldier beans are going nuts, are actually crawling up the sunflowers and I don't see any stunting happening, but I haven't started harvesting the beans yet. Here, it ended up being a non-issue because these are bush beans. The, I'm pretty sure these are red swans. And if the sunflowers do put off some chemical to stunt them, I don't really know because the red swans are, they're pretty much done. So I'm gonna go ahead and pull them out after we do like the final harvest and figure out what else I'm gonna put in this bed next to these teddy bear sunflowers. Okay, so the garlic bed is, is pretty much harvested. A few of the smaller ones I'd left in here and it's gonna be time to pull them. They're not gonna do anything else, but there, is actually my last head of elephant garlic and I was hoping it would bulb up a little bit more. Oh, can you guys see the fireflies? All right, let's give this guy a pull and see what, what it's like. Yeah, not a lot. I really let these go too far. I should have cut the scapes off sooner and I would have gotten larger bulbs. I mean, that's still a pretty good size garlic bowl, but elephant garlic can get like five times that size. Oh well, better luck next time. We are running out of light and I really wanna show you guys these two rows. So excuse the cruddy video quality. There's just too much to end the tour right here. So here I have my long row of Canter green beans, which is kind of like a thin, green bean and man these things are going to be so prolific they're covered in blossoms covered in little beans so this is going to be my next canning endeavor you know after i get done processing the gallons of purple beans that are still coming off of those pole beans <laughs> here i've got some yamato long cucumbers they're coming up the trellis nicely but check this out the rampicante squash which i was certain was dead because the squash bugs had just beaten it up. Look at that. Check that out. I'm actually about to cut that guy down. All right. <laughs> Look at that. Oh man, there's a couple more on here that I think, I mean, the skin's still soft. I don't want them to get too, too tough. Check that out. I went over to my friends Jill and Nathan this other day. I was actually photographing her birth and Nathan and I were talking um, before the labor got really serious and you know, we got really serious with it. But beforehand we were talking about the garden. They grow a really beautiful garden. And he actually said that they were growing the Rampicante squash this year and he was loving it. I've heard varying opinions about the flavor. 
I've had some people tell me that they thought it was really bland. Some people likened it more to the flavor of a butternut. I don't know. I will get back with you on my opinion. I have not had it yet. But obviously, this is a lot of squash. And if I could get this one plant to grow well and do well enough to keep us eating fresh squash through the summer, which is the main reason why I grow squash is just to eat it fresh, um, I would be happy. It would make up for the rest of my utter squash failures if we could get a harvest like this. Just every couple of days, that would be enough. That's a lot of squash. It's like multiple pounds of squash. And if you can see here, there are quite a few on here. This plant goes all the way down to the other side. Now, I think one of them or part of it did die off, so I'm gonna prune that back, but it looks like the rest of this is still kicking. My Armenian white cucumbers are going everywhere. Um, and they are covered in flowers, but I don't see any fruit on them yet. However, when they take off, they grow fast. That's another thing that you have to check, like at least daily, sometimes twice a day, because they can get huge fast. It's really getting dark. I bet the woods behind me are getting really, really loud. I don't know about y'all, but I love that sound. Here I've got melons going berserk. Probably gonna have to work some with these to get them to climb up, because they're spilling all out. And basically that just looks like taking these things and making sure that they're getting thrown over this trellis and if they keep trying to grow down, uh, just persistently telling them, no, you may not. Purple hole peas here are getting big. Those will go berserk. And the snake beans must like the heat because they have finally just taken off. The blossoms on these are just beyond cool. Look at that. Isn't that neat? And the okra down here on the end has just really started to show out. This is the Texas Hill Country, and I don't know if you're going to be able to see it, but there are just multiple pods coming up daily, and it's getting to where now the main stalk has parts branching out, and so it's just setting all kinds of flowers. So when the okra starts, it's like one main stalk, and you get a couple pods here and there but as it grows up it sort of br branches out and trees out so you've got three or four areas growing out and each one is putting off multiple blossoms at a time so okra gets a little bit of a slow start but then once it takes off you'll be completely covered up in it i'm running out of light my hot biscuits amaranth is looking beautiful look at this can y'all hear the wild things in the trees they're saying, go inside, this is our garden now. <laughs> this amaranth is twice the size of the other ones. Look at that, isn't that crazy? Melons, these are the Israel melons. Again, gonna have to really work on them going up the trellis. Oh wow, I have neglected to harvest the cucumbers. I've got quite a few over here. I was kind of beginning to wonder if I was gonna end up with very many cucumbers this year. Uh, because they're usually not this late really getting started, but by the looks of all my cucumber plants They're starting to really ripen fruit and they're covered in blossoms So it's gonna be time for me to make a lot of pickles over the next couple of weeks It's crazy how stuff like that with cucumbers here the season for cucumbers is not very long because they come on like fast and furious and then it gets really really hot and they get bitter um, so I actually usually harvest the majority of the cucumbers within like a two or three week span. Usually it's earlier. So hopefully we'll have good flavored cucumbers for a good long while. And then a lot of times I regrow them again later on in the year and have a fall harvest of them. So I am obviously out of light. <laughs> I wanted to make sure to get this shot this evening so I could get it out for you guys. Well, those are some full baskets. Well, I completely and utterly ran out of light out there, so this garden tour is over. <laughs> There's probably a little more we could have looked at, but uh, not in the dark. I've got a lot of food to deal with. It is hot outside, even at night. Um, I hope that your garden is, at this point, overwhelming you with bounty. And if you're watching this during the cold, miserable winter months, uh, just remember that <laughs> it's time to rest the season of the overwhelming bounty. It will come again. <laughs>
wise words from the middle of summer. Thank you guys for hanging out with me today. Uh, I do so love sharing my garden with you. I bless you. Until next time.